Today, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Kai Winnerman to give his uh, second talk. You know, I mean, um, the second of his many talks, I think. Uh, and <laughs> and, and the, the, the here we tell us uh, something very interesting about the um, how the impact, right? The, the impact process uh, kind of you know, determine the evolution of history of the moon and even the, the structure. The, uh, Yes, uh, uh, Kai, please. Uh, yeah, welcome to the seminar. It's a great pleasure to be here again and tell you some, some more stories about uh, how impact, so this is basically the title, how impact processes uh, in the formation of the early, uh, the, or the role of impact processes in the early evolution of, I put here Earth-Moon system because I don't really think you can look at these things really separate. The moon is basically what we look at because it provides the best record. But uh, I think in many respect, we are interested in this because it directly also affects or, or matters for the evolution of Earth. That's why I thought it makes more sense here to put the Earth moon system. And indeed, at the beginning, I will talk a little bit more about actually Earth than moon, but in this large research, collaborative research project, late accretion onto terrestrial planets. And uh, I will name them when it comes to the different parts. That's Lukas Manske, Nicole Güldemeister, Tom Golompa. And I think last time I mentioned already my close collaboration with Meng Hao Chu uh, at the Macau University. And I will also appoint you to the work which is mostly based on, on him. So um, let's start the story. Um, it's maybe a bit of a repetition at the beginning as some sort of an uh, introduction, if you will, so that we are all on the same page. Um, basically, the accretion starts before the Earth, uh, well, the Moon was basically formed. So that's just a sort of nice illustration what has been going on. So there was a, um, a, a proto-Earth that was heavily bombarded. And what was the exact state of the Earth before the Moon was formed is more or less unclear. We would, we would assume it was a rather hot world. But what it was exactly like is, is rather unclear. And then this um, major impact event, or you could also say there were probably more of such events before, but this is the, maybe the last one of the really giant impact events that occurred or the Earth was suffering from. And this is thought to be the one that formed the, the moon. I tend to call this the mother of all impact events, but it's certainly only one example of this because uh, it's just maybe the only one we have a record of, and that's basically the, the moon itself. And this is maybe the, the starting point of this story. So when this event happened, we can be rather certain that what was after, right after was there was a moon, and this moon was extremely hot and was maybe entirely molten, also a, a little bit of a question, but uh, there was certainly, it was covered by a thick magma ocean, and the Earth, well, this is now the question, what was the state of the Earth after this impact event? Um, the Earth before was differentiated, was a planet with a core and a mantle and a crust. Maybe there was even a, um, a primordial atmosphere there around. Um, whether that was lost in this event, these are all questions. I think you heard quite a bit of this, but there are that's, that's debated and there's um, a different views on it, what, what has uh, actually been going on. Um, what then happened was uh, a continuous bombardment. So we had um, loads of impact that happened on Earth and Moon. And this is what I was talking about in the beginning. On Earth, we have very little record of this bombardment. On Moon, we have some. It's also a question I will try to answer at least in part today. Uh, to what extent we have a complete or, or incomplete record of this. but. The moon may allow us to estimate how intense this bombardment was. So how much material was actually delivered after the moon formation to the Earth's moon system. And this is important because it is thought that uh, this bombardment actually significantly contributed to how Earth evolved from a planet hostile to life to a habitable world as we know it today. 
Well, that's a, a really big question and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I won't answer this, yeah, but uh, I just put this here to remind you maybe a little bit once again of the motivation why we're doing this, you know, why do we study the moon? It's, I mean, it's exciting, it's nice to look at, but in fact, I believe the traces of the bombardment that we can discover on the moon tell us basically the story of our, our own world and why we're here and why the earth is as it is like. Um, but that's a long story and uh, there's loads to do to fully understand this, but the roots of all of this, to my understanding, uh, maybe go back to the formation of the moon, maybe part in it, but then certainly what was happening after. So questions I will address here and maybe get somewhat closer to answer them here today are, uh, what was the thermal state of the Earth after the moon formation? So the formation and extent of a global or not global magma ocean. Um, uh, well, that's that's very important because it tells us something about how much of the impact record we can actually expect on Earth. Uh, then the other story or the, the probably key question here I want to answer and I raised this point here already is how much material was delivered during this what is called the late accretion so late accretion late means after the moon formation officially this is actually meant to be the uh, the impact that was going on after core formation of the planets well that's not goes exactly in line with the moon formation but we consider or you could also define this late accretion the starting point of late accretion the, with the moon formation event okay and then at the end i want to say a little bit also about the how the subsequent bombardment then further affected the thermal evolution of the moon did it cool faster or slower or what was the actual effect on the thermal evolution of the moon Okay, let's start with the first question. And um, of course, that has to start with some sort of moon forming event because um, you would consider did the moon forming event actually cause the complete melting of the Earth as well. Um, that's a very controversial story and it depends a lot on what you assume the Earth was like at the time the moon forming event actually occurred. This is a courtesy from Miki Nakajima and um, in such an event here you see this, this, this simulation don't really tell you exactly the story about temperatures and what's the, the state. This is basically showing the material distribution and I think you've heard in one of the, the previous talks already um, uh, the moon formation, the story about the moon formation and the problems that come with it, that is clearly somehow related to the isotopic similarity of the Earth and the moon and uh, whether there was a loss of a primordial atmosphere and volatiles and but th these are stories I don't really want to touch here. I want to focus on uh, in the first bit what was the state of the Earth after it and did we have a global magma ocean and how do impact actually contributed to the to the uh, um, uh, to the existence of the magma ocean how long it lasts and uh, uh, whether there was maybe even a secondary magma ocean by this heavy bombardment okay um, we do this in a very similar way as you've seen here in this models these are so-called sph models sph stands for smooth particle hydrodynamics uh, that's a very, very efficient and very uh, uh, smart way uh, to run these simulation. This is based on uh, grid free, um, it's a grid free method. So you basically have particles and make these particles collide with one, uh, with one another. That's a very efficient way to look at how material is distributed after an impact. But it's a somewhat less, at least this is my opinion, a somewhat less accurate method to estimate temperatures or uh, basically estimate shock pressures. And as you may recall in my first seminar, which was more an introductory in the impact process, I also talked a little bit about shock, uh, the, the generation of a shock wave by an impact event. And this, this shock wave is the, 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 the mechanism that causes heating or that delivers heat to the to the target material and then also um, results in melting. So this is a simulation we actually did for a very, one, one of the scenarios you may believe in or not. This is what they call the canonical impact scenario. So a classical impact uh, of a mass sized body on the moon here at an angle of 30 degrees. The velocity here was 12 kilometers per second. 
and you see here uh, temperatures then. So we made some assumptions about a rather hot Earth at this beginning, and then you see how temperature is distributed. Well, temperature itself doesn't really tell you whether material melts. As you know, um, a melting temperature also depends on, on the pressure. So it matters on where you are in a planet at what depths you actually uh, uh, um, uh, compress material by a shock pressure. And this has be, to be all somehow related. And then um, um, I want to look at how the subsequent flux of impactors may cause remelting or maybe prolong the existence of the magma ocean in this scenario. Okay, um, as I said, uh, how, how do you quantify the melt production? And uh, you do this, um, this is a, a depth profile. So you see here, this is the well, one temperature profile you may assume. This is the melting temperature and um, heating is proportional to the peak shock pressure. So the, the, the highest pressure you reach by the shock pressure in the material itself. Yeah. So when you are at a certain depth here, something like 350 uh, kilometers depth, uh, somewhere deep in the mantle, you add some delta T Due to, which is proportional to the peak shock pressure to your material. And if this delta, delta T is big enough, so you cross the solidos, which is also a function of pressure, as you see, then you generate melt. How does it look like in a, in a model? So this is um, some simulation by, by, by Lukas Manske in, in my group. So this is just a one, one impactor. With, this is maybe about 200 kilometers in diameter. And what you see now in color contours is um, we have here a, a mantle and the, the, the crust in grayish colors, but the reddish colors basically show you whether you have complete or uh, the beginning of melting. And this, this is the simulation how it goes. So you see you generate a lot of melt, some sort of partial melting here at some depth, but then you make a, a large melt pool that extends all over the surface and you may understand or can assume if you have loads of those, then this melt will accumulate somehow and you may generate an additional melt ocean basically that may cover the, the entire earth and that also holds true then for the moon. Uh, however, shock melting is not the only thing that can contribute to melting. You have also something what we call decompression melting. So if the material, let's, let's uh, state for, uh, let's uh, stick with this example. So you add it to this material portion here at some depths, a delta T. And if this material is then in the course of the crater formation process, lifted upwards. So it's upwelling material that is somehow by the, uh, by the uh, crater me uh, mechanical process, the formation process, somehow transported upwards, you decrease the lithostatic pressure. And that's also a way how you may cross the solidus line. So you have some delta D, which we consider then as the decompression melting. How much is this in such an impact event? So I show you now the same simulation, but the colors now don't show how much is melted, how much melt you generate by uh, um, temperature. It basically uh, shows you how much melting occurs due to, to uh, uh, shock melting and how much due to decompression melting. So let's start the simulation and then you see it's basically the same simulation, only the color contours show now the differences. So you see that decompression melting here also significantly contributes to the entire melting process. So in this specific, oops, I think I thought, oh no, it's, uh, sorry. Um, there is another um, uh, process that we are, we are currently working on that is not included in here, that is also plastic work. If you deform material, you, you add a lot of heat by plastic work, which is not so trivial to, to quantify, in particular not in the way how, how we do it, but we've recently made some good progress in this, and that's something that could be actually added to all of this. Yeah? So, Maybe we can look at it now as um, 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 a lower estimate. So in effect, in the end, we may even generate a little bit more melt if we also consider plastic work. Um, to balance these two processes, I've also put this here one next to each other. So you see here on the right hand side, the outcome of the previous simulation and uh, on the left hand side for the 
for the melting due to shock pressure. And um, what is also interesting to see is if you now reverse the simulation, so I'm just running it now backwards, you can also see in what part of the target you generate melting due to what of the processes. So this is the same simulations, just the side, but going backwards now. And then you end up with this figure showing you that uh, this is now the origin of the material basically so the initial setup so you see the projectile the impactor is completely molten due to shock but you have uh, here a large what we call the isobaric zone a large zone where we also generate a lot of melt due to shock but we have surrounding this here also a significant contribution from decompression melting so these are the things that we have to consider if we want to find if we want to quantify the melt production now back to the moon forming event. So this is from, from Nicole Güldemeister simulations. Uh, we varied the, the impact angle. In this case, we kept the, the initial velocity constant. Key is what I don't show in here is indeed what you assume as the initial temperature state of the, of the uh, Earth at this stage, which is something you can play with because we don't exactly know. So these are similar simulations as you've seen before. Here I only record the peak shock pressure, so that doesn't really tell you a lot, but it, I'm just showing this as a, a nice animation, what, how, the, how the process are, are kind of looking like. But the outcome is what we're mostly interested in a figure like this. So this shows the amount of melting after these three impact events. This is not the really final state. Um, but the state where the vast majority of the melt is generated, you have to consider these simulations are computationally very expensive. So it takes several weeks to, one, to run one of these simulations, in fact. Um, but we see that even in a relatively shallow angle, we get here a more or less complete magma ocean. So we have melting all the way around the globe. Um, and with steeper impact angles, we increase melting. It's something you can quantify. In fact, uh, we have now some more points in this diagram showing now the impact angle uh, versus the melt volume normalized by the volume of the projectile. So the sort of uh, for the moon scenario, a mass sized body. And uh, then you see with increase of impact angle, you increase more melt. These lines here show that 20% of the mantle is molten. We always assume that the melt is evenly distributed more or less in the end. So to a, to a depth of 20% of the mantle, we, we achieve here complete melting in a scenario of 45 degree impact angle. The green line up here would be complete melting of the earth mantle from the, from the moon forming event. And you don't even achieve this if you assume a head-on collision. So this is a vertical impact 90 degree. Uh, you don't even get there for this scenario. Note, this is based on assumptions for the temp temperature profile and also um, uh, of the velocity. So here I didn't show any variations of velocity. It is kept at 12 kilometers per second. Recently, the so-called high angular momentum simulations or models related to the so-called Sinestria model, uh, it is assumed that the impact velocity may be even higher. That, of course, uh, allows uh, a further extent of melting, but comes with other problems that are difficult to explain. These scenarios certainly have the problem that they don't explain the moon formation uh, uh, with respect to the material share, you know. that uh, moon was formed in some sort of accretionary disk. So um, in an, an oblique, this is uh, 30 degree, um, the, the vast majority of the material of the impactor goes into some orbit of the moon, uh, of the Earth, of the proto-Earth, 
And in such a scenario, the moon would form mostly from the impactor material, which is also not really consistent with the isotopic signature or isotopic similarity. However, there are also people who believe that it's not unlikely that the impactor that struck the Earth to form the moon was isotopically very similar to the Earth. So that's, that's a sort of cheap way of explaining the, uh, the problems. I'm not um, a cosmochemistrist, so don't ask me whether this is indeed realistic or not. But there's, this is certainly debated. OK, but that's not the topic of my talk. I want to carry on with the story about um, melting and formation of magma oceans. And uh, here I plot now the size of impactors. This is again normalized melt volume. So the amount of melt you generate, the volume of melt normalized by the projectile. Um, here are the results from the three simulations I showed you at three different uh, impact angles. These are the lines I also showed you before. So that would be 100% melting of the mantle, 20% melting of the mantle. And these grayish lines, um, there's where, where it says crust and mantle, that's a little bit confusing. These are lines what, when you use classical scaling laws, I, I think I referred to this in my previous uh, uh, lecture, classical scaling laws to estimate the melt production as a function of impact or size. You're based on an old paper from Betty Pirazzo. And uh, I separate here crust and mantle because you can imagine it's easier to melt crust than mantle material. That's why we have these two separate lines. So if we add now a series of simulations, so we, we vary the impact or size, not just going, going from the moon formation event as the biggest to smaller events, then we get something like this, which is totally different to the predicted uh, scaling lines that we find in here. So we see that here somewhere at smaller impactors, so this is really small, something between one and maybe 20 kilometers or so, uh, our predictions are in line with the, with the scaling laws. That doesn't really much of a surprise. But then suddenly this really ramps up here and goes to a factor of uh, twice, or if you compare it with the mantle, and note this is mostly mantle that you actually melt here, you maybe even have here a factor of um, uh, five or something like this. Yeah, So it's significant. And this is mostly due to the fact that we assume that the, the, the Earth, or that in a way also applies to the Moon, isn't cold at the time of impact. It is hot and the temperature increases with depth. This reddish shaded area here is the contribution from decompression melting. Yeah, so you see we have here a peak at some 100 kilometers and then this goes down again and this is due to the fact that when you have even larger impactors you want to melt material at greater depths which becomes more difficult because at greater depths the solidus is much higher due to the given pressure. That's more or less shown in here. So these are two different temperature profiles. This is the one that we consider here, the red one. There's also a cold one. This is the blue one where this is not so pronounced. And you see that for a certain air range, this more or less follows the solidus. So that is the area where we have significant melting. But if we have larger impactors where most of the melting should occur at even greater depths, then you see the solidus increases so quickly with, with depths or pressure that it is, it's getting harder again to cause melting. So that's why for the moon form forming event, it is um, they're, they're somewhere down here. So they're not as efficient in terms of melting than the somewhat smaller impactors. Uh, interestingly, this is uh, something that applies also to the, to the moon in a way. Um, uh, what we then did, we compared the volume of melt with the volume of the craters. So if you, if you try to estimate what was actually the size of these craters, then we found that these impactors larger than 100 kilometers, they produce so much melt that the crater basically, we, we say they drown in their own melt. So in the end, you probably don't end up with a crater in such cases, you end up with an igneous province. So uh, you have just melt that is flooding the crater and is in there, there, there's only melt, you know, in the end, you don't end up with maybe a basin structure. It's, it's kind of hard to say whether this is true 
um, right or wrong, um, because, uh, you know, that goes in line with the formation of magma ocean. So that kind of confirms that maybe at an early stage, we won't keep record of these impacts, um, uh, because there's basically nothing there. And you produce only this melt, which may contribute to uh, remnants of the magma ocean, and you produce this sort of big melt pools or, or partial magma oceans or something like this. This is a bit speculative because you have to make assumptions where the melt actually ends up. So this is the cold case that is maybe not so in interesting. Um, for the hot case, the vast majority or a large part of the melt you produce at some depth. And uh, usually geodynamicists assume that this melt tends to be buoyant, so it wouldn't last long that all this melt is, is uh, um, going up to the surface and then forms a, a big melt pool at the end. But that's not part of the simulation that we can produce. They're, they're, they usually show the, the final state where the material ends up when the, the sort of uh, major dynamic motions have ceased. And, um, and there we have a significant melting to great depths, but it is likely that this will be upwelling and then form this sort of a melt pool at the surface. Here I stated this again, so the formation of igneous provinces and no basin structures is maybe likely. Okay, uh, but that's just individual impact events. Now we have to consider that uh, that comes with a flux. So there are loads of those impacts. In particular, right after the moon formation event, there were several very big impact events. Um, it's speculative whether we have record of those. And it's a question then, did they then maybe prolonged the existence of a magma ocean or maybe were uh, um, uh, capable to uh, uh, form a secondary magma ocean? So we now show you some results of the cumulative outcome if we make assumptions about the impact flux. So this is typical flux models time where there's the, the number of impacts here. And um, uh, this is the classic Neukom and Ivanov exponential decay. We didn't consider here the, 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 the sawtooth model, which is a little bit out of date now. I think there are several modifications of this. Um, but certainly it would predict less impact. So we go with the sort of upper case of the number of impacts and assume this um, um, exponential decay. Then we see, as I've shown in the beginning, the moon forming event may cause a global magma ocean and we get 20, 30 percent, uh, maybe 40 percent melting of the mantle uh, for sort of a classic canonical scenario depending a little bit on the impact angle. And now if we accumulate, uh, given the flux model, the outcome of melt by the subsequent uh, bombardment, then we see this. So in different time periods, we split it up here into 100 million year uh, boxes. You see, assuming different temperature profiles, but I think realistic is here basically the hot one, that the addition of melt by these, although it appears to be huge, is in the end uh, rather negligible. Yeah? So it's just a little bit above a percent. So these impact events uh, on, on Earth may have caused uh, a longer lasting uh, existence of a magma ocean, but didn't really contribute to it and were certainly incapable to form a secondary magma ocean. For the moon, that also holds true. However, bear in mind the moon is smaller, so the, 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 the temperature gradient with depths is less steep as on Earth. So that allows the melt production to be a little bit more efficient on the moon than it is on, on Earth. Okay, so we, we are there that we have a global magma ocean. It's not completely molten the Earth. And for the moon, we also have a more or less global magma ocean at this stage. So now the second question I want to address is um, how much material was then delivered? And you know, if there was a magma ocean, and the, the impacts in a magma ocean don't really produce any record, can we still sort of reconstruct the impact from the, the impact record and thus how much material was delivered. Now I will focus a little bit more on the moon, um, although it was part of all of this because the matter of case here is that uh, moon was formed from these impact events. 
Um, uh, we can look at um, now the, 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 the mass that was added after the moon formation, either on Earth and the moon. So we have this bombardment by bodies, various bodies, some of them may be differentiated, others maybe not. We have a magma ocean here surrounding it. We assume that the mantle and thus also the, 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 the magma ocean were, um, um, yeah, well, let me first uh, get into this story about highly uh, siderophile elements. So we are now using as, a, as an imprint of this impact record, not the craters itself, because they hardly exist if they fall into a magma ocean. We now use the uh, highly siderophile elements that have been measured for the, for the mantle of the Earth and uh, for the Moon, and assuming some sort of chondritic uh, uh, composition of all of these impactors, we can try to estimate, given the the distribution of these highly siderophile elements, the abundance of these uh, uh, elements in the Earth's mantle and the Moon, how much material was delivered after the formation of the of the core. Highly siderophile elements means that these elements are um, um, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, tend to go into the core. So this is material that are iron-loving elements. So we assume that the, the, after the core formation, there were, uh, there were rarely any of these elements in, in the mantle left. That's true for the Earth and the Moon. And everything that was then delivered by the subsequent bombardment uh, then kind of replenished the, 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 the higher siderophil element budget of the mantle of the Earth and the Moon and then is a good record or a good um, a measure of the amount of material that was delivered. The problem here comes with, with comparing the numbers that you can gain from the material in the Earth and the Moon, or the, the isotopic signature for the Earth mantle and the Moon. So we see that there's three, three orders of magnitude more material apparently delivered to the Earth than to the Moon. How can that be? You know, we would expect that the flux for the Earth's moon system is more or less the same. Okay, the moon is much smaller than the Earth. So you can work out, given the different uh, surface ratios, that uh, it is easy to explain that the Earth should have about 20 times more material received than the moon. But um, here we have three orders of magnitude differences. So that requires further explanation. There have been several attempts to how to explain it. But I think recently we came up with a, a nice explanation that kind of resolves this problem and then gives us a realistic figure of how much material was delivered. So the question, why did the moon receive disproportionately less late accreted material than the Earth? And that is related to the, the impact process itself. So very similar to what you've seen in the beginning for the moon forming event, but now we're looking at somewhat smaller impactors and look at how much of this material actually retains on the, the moon when this impactor struck the Earth. So this is such an event. So you see here the formation of this impact event that goes very quickly. I show that at the beginning, but in this scenario, you have a 30 degree angle, 15 kilometers per second, 600 kilometer size impactor. You see that basically all of the impactor material is quickly going here out of the frame. So that basically means that in such a scenario, hardly any of the impactor material is retained on the moon. So such an impact event wouldn't be very efficient in adding material to the moon. That may be look different when you look at the same scenario on Earth. Here are a few snapshots of this. So you see here this in, in a little bit more detail. This is the impact door and the vast majority of this material is kind of sheared off and then leaves the, 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 the gravity field here of the moon and is then not added to the to the budget of the moon. So in this case, we have here differentiated bodies. So the inner core will carry, we would expect to deliver a lot of highly siderophil elements and thus uh, something that we would, would see in the, the abundance record of these elements uh, when we sample the moon. Um, so that clearly has to do something with uh, the impact velocity, the impact angle, and in fact, also the impact or size. Uh, 
and also the escape velocity of the moon. So here is a figure for this given scenario here of uh, how much of the impactor material. So this is the impactor, this body in here, and the colors show the velocities of the material um, upon impact. Yeah? And yet then you see that the vast majority of the impactor material has a high velocity, so it basically escapes. You can carry out systematic studies, and this was first done here together with uh, Meng Hao Chu. Um, he actually uh, um, noted this, that in previous assumptions about the delivery ratio, people did not consider that impact angle, velocity, and so on, and particular size of the impactor actually matters. They always assume that there is um, a retention ratio, so the, the fraction of material of the impactor that retains on a, on a planet, they put that more in general, is about 60% or so. That was taken as an average. Yeah? So that is based on simple lab experiments and um, where, where all these parameters are not well considered. This is just one of the plots for a given velocity. Actually, there are loads of those plots with different velocities. But you know, if you vary too many parameters, it's hard to plot that all into one diagram. So let's take this just as an example. And you see here the impactor diameter relative to the moon's diameter. So just a size ratio of the impactors. And this is the impactor retention factor. So the ratio of how much material retains on the moon. And then let's look first here at these guys. These are almost vertical impacts. You remember similar to the to the to the moon forming event I showed you at the beginning for a vertical impact uh, where all of the impact of material retained on on early earth this also holds true for smaller impactors impacting on the moon we almost have here a retention of 80 percent so almost one so all of the material independent of the size of the impactor remains on the moon in such a case but then interestingly if you vary the impact angle, um, you see that the retention ratio changes. So that would be going down here, maybe. Yeah. So with different angles, you get less material retained, which maybe may, is maybe obvious. But you also see that the size ratio also matters. So the bigger the impactor, the less material retains. Yeah, so smaller impactors are more efficient in their retention, bigger impactors are less efficient in their retention. So, um, yeah, this is what I've just said. Um, so impact of size, angle and velocity matters. And then you can put this all into something like a parameterization. So the retention ratio becomes a function of impactor size, angle and velocity. And then you can combine this again with the flux model. Forget about the, the sawtooth model. Again, we assume the exponential decay. So these two things you can combine. And then you can work out the average impactor retention ratio over time. So when we start to retain material right uh, very, very early, so after 4.5 million years, right after the moon formation, we have a very low retention ratio because a lot of very big impactors occurred. If we start um, to work out the average retention ratio for, for younger periods of the bombardment, it goes up, but it doesn't go above 3.5. And as I said before, it was assumed previously that for the Earth, uh, we assume something like 0.5 to 0.6. So in particular, during the early stage, we have a three times higher retention ratio, uh, lower retention ratio on the moon than was previously assumed. So, and um, if we take this now into consideration, we can kind of re-explain the, the delivery of material to the moon as uh, a matter of impacts. And mm, this, is, this is shown in this diagram. So this is the cu cumulative mass of impactors as a function of time. So if you start to accumulate at 4.5 billion years, you get a very high number, and this is just the accumulated numbers at earlier or younger starting times. Yeah, so if you start to accumulate at 3.5, you only get a very little amount of total impactors. So this is basically what comes directly out of the flux model. If we combine this now with these retention factors that we worked out, much reduced retention factors, we get this purple line here. Uh, so only a certain amount, it's not constant, so it ver varies a little bit in terms of its distance to the total amount of impactors, depending on the, the retention I showed you uh, before. 
And then we can plot in here the total amount of accreted material we know from highly siderophil elements. And that crosses the, the line that we propose here at, at, at a time period of 4.35 uh, billion years. And this is what we assume roughly the time when um, the, the magma ocean on the Earth may be solidified. So the crystallization of the lunar magma ocean, we put at uh, um, about 150 to 200 million years after the formation of the moon. And that would be then in line with the, with the assumed or the, the observed uh, abundance of highly cereal field elements or the amount of material that was accreted based on the uh, um, abundance of highly cereal field elements. And that is actually also in line, if you look a little bit more in detail, uh, how much of highly cedrophil elements we can sample or find in just the mantle, then we see that the, the, the line crosses our uh, estimates here at the same time. And this also holds true if we just look at the lunar crust. So that seems to be, this study seems to be a very good measure or indication of first of all, the total amount of material that was delivered. And second, when the lunar magma ocean was completely solidified. So we, we are able to derive from um, uh, the, 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 the abundance of these elements in combination with these impact models how much material was delivered to the moon. And this is then something we can also uh, um, then easily estimate how much was hitting the earth. So that has that comes indeed with some implications. So the moon underwent then due to this a much more intense bombardment than what we may have assumed just given uh, the or just based on the existing crater record. So our simulation here suggests that there may be 300 basins, larger basins we consider here as impacts larger than 300 kilometers during the lunar impact history. Uh, we know there are only, we, we are aware of at the most 90 or so, usually it's assumed something between 40 and 90 of impact basins we may know about the moon. So why that is? Well, uh, all the impacts that occurred before 4.35 billion years, they basically hit a magma ocean. And as I said before, there is not really a big record of this. They, they, they drown in their own melt or they fall into melt itself. So nothing really remains. So no record of those. This is about 200. So there remain only, only um, um, uh, 100 less. So then we also presume that uh, in, the, in the very early stage where the magma ocean was just solidified, but things behaved a lot more viscous and we have maybe much more enhanced relaxation processes. We estimated in this period, maybe 50% or so, which is just a, a, a very crude estimate may not be preserved. An example for this, this is another study uh, I did with Meng Hao Zhu on the so-called Procellarum impact basin. event, which is called the Procellarum impact. It's not um, uh, agreed on, but uh, in this paper, we made uh, um, an estimate of this, whether that is in line with some of the observation. I can show you here the simulation of this large impact event, the Procellarum impact basin. Well, that may be one of those you can consider that happened in this period. And um, they are obviously not showing clear typical characteristics of large impact basins. And that's why I put it here as an example of one of those that were not fully preserved or where their, their interpretation is a bit shaky. Uh, yeah, this is related to the, uh, to the crustal thickness you can derive from gravity data and from our models that this is somehow in line with the observations, but that's a separate story I don't wanna address here. Uh, so we end up with something like uh, another 20 basins that may have survived. So in the end, we fall into the, the range that may be a, a rough estimate of 65 basins in the end, uh, which corresponds approximately to the 40 or 90 basins that were assumed. So this study is 
uh, it doesn't contradict the the um, um, assumptions that are based on the greater record. I think this is more or less in line. However, it proposes that there are there have been very much more impacts early on. Yeah. Um, how do we know what is the actual impact flux or how many of these impact actually occurred? I, I, I presented to you this, this sort of exponential flux model, which is based on, on impacts, but that also requires that we translate the impact record that we have on the moon into impact or sizes. So we have to find some sort of a relationship between these two things, which is I wouldn't say simple, but I think I addressed this in my previous lecture for smaller impacts, but what about Besson sizes? And there comes into the problem, and as I kind of touched already before, the, the, the surface expression of Besson is not the same as for smaller impacts, and it's already hard to measure actually the real size. This is uh, from the GRAIL mission, the, the LOLA topography data showing some of the Bessons. So this, by the way, would be the Procellarum uh, Besson structure underneath here with, with younger Bessons on top of it. And um, when you look at the gravity data, let's go straight to the boogie gravity data. Then we see that they show nice evidence also or nice picture of the, the Bessons themselves. So we see a nice gravity signature, which may be a better measure of the size of an impact than the actual surface expression. In some of the cases, there isn't really anything we can read from the surface. The only thing that remains are, in fact, the, the, the gravity data in here. And uh, yeah, this has been also translated into a crustal thickness model that is uh, work uh, also in part done by Mark Vitorek. You may have heard in his seminar about this. And uh, we can compare this with our models. Um, this is a simulation of a large impact basin. Again, we have to consider whether the crust was already cold or I wouldn't, wouldn't say hot anymore. It may have been warm now, which is a, a little bit less um, um, extreme case. But you see, these this are the two cases here, the, the hot or the warm and the cold one, uh, similar to what we've seen before. Um, and then you see that even for the structure model, this, this also matters. So in the warm case, you have here some more of these oscillations. In the cold case, somewhat less. You end up with a structure which is kind of similar, but it's also somewhat different. And you can estimate or you can see maybe that the gravity, gravity signature you can derive from this may be different. So what we did then was we varied, we, we run Brazilian of models, varied the impact of size, the temperature profile, we also varied the crustal thickness models and so on. So we produced a large database and then worked out, this is sort of this blue uh, brownish model, the brown color or yellow color here shows the, the crust, the blue is mantle material. This is the sort of final structure, subsurface structure of one of our models. Then we worked out what would be the gravity signature from this and then compared it with the observed gravity signature, which is here our model is the, the solid black line, the observed is the dashed line. This is uh, the transient crater, by the way, this dashed line. We measure the size of the thickest part of the, 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 the crust here, what we call the DLCT value, so the diameter of the largest crustal thickness and also the diameter of the Bouguie anomaly, which is here, these, these two points. And then we pick this model that best fit the observed gravity signature. And these models, then we plot it in here, where we plot this diameter of the Bouguie anomaly, where this is the diameter of this DLCT value. And then we see that there is more or less a straight line. These are all examples of given Bessons. We picked 40 Bessons on the lunar far side. Uh, they are, they're all numbered here, and uh, you see they more or less follow a clear trend in here, which is a little bit less than a one-to-one -one ratio. So th these, this diameter is, um, or this diameter is roughly 80% of this diameter. So you can see that the size of the structure is directly related to the boogie anomaly, and we can even say how much that, that roughly is. Um, so now we can use this also to estimate the, the, the size of a basin um, uh, or the, the size of the impact or that formed the basin. This is an example for Herzsprung. 
has a diameter of the basin has 400 kilometers. So we could go here into our diagram, read the 400 kilometer diameter and see the DLCT. So the, uh, the diameter of the largest crustal thickness is maybe about 340 or something. Forgot the number in here. And then we can look into our models, look at the 340 kilometers and then translate this here into an impactor size. So this is also a transient crater where this impactor size, this DLCT value for different temperature profiles. These are the different colored stars in here. Uh, so you could also read this figure here a little bit further to the right if you assume a somewhat cooler uh, um, condition at the time of impact. So you find, oh, sorry. So you find that the uh, impactor size was here somewhere between 50 and 60 kilometers. Yeah, then you can look at this in terms of the temperature, uh, uh, so the cooling history and the the exact uh, the, the formation time, which is based on the crater record. This is the selection of, of basins that we, we chose for this study. And here we plotted it against uh, time. So this is this ratio I said about 80 to 90 percent of the DLCT over the, the Bouguer anomaly where this age and you see that this is nicely in line with the estimated ages, the formation ages of the time. We have in this example only Orientale as a rather young and cold impact. The vast majority occur somewhere between 4 billion years where we assume that the temperature gradient was rather moderate. And we have very few cases where it was rather hot, which is also what we would assume that when the, the target was hot, the preservation of such basins is very poor and only few of those survived. Okay, um, I think I skip here if you, a little bit more. I have also something about the subsequent cooling history, but I'm getting close to an hour and then I would just uh, um, close this here with a short summary. So um, uh, the first question, what was the thermal state of the Earth after the moon formation? Again, after the formation of the moon was the Earth was clearly covered by a global magma ocean, but we presume that it did not entirely molten. The subsequent impact flux prolonged the lifetime of the magma ocean, but was not capable to form a secondary magma ocean, which has been also many times proposed and uh, the large impacts in the early earth form maybe igneous provinces uh, that were maybe also on the moon igneous provinces rather than actually basins so the preservation of this early impact record is very poor um, uh, i can actually go into the presentation mode here again so what was uh, I've, I've had this yeah sorry Yeah, here I was. So how much material was delivered during late accretion? So it was uh, a less efficient impactor retention on the moon than previously assumed. That explains the disproportional um, um, uh, delivery of material to the moon and the Earth and gives us a good estimate of the entire uh, um, amount of material that was delivered and that is in line with an exponential decay. We don't need any more complicated flux models like the sawtooth or variants that were followed after this by, by this. They're all more or less uh, the same. And um, that implies that we had a lot more larger impacts and those that occurred in the very early time were not preserved. And this is also in line of my uh, previous uh, uh, conclusion that uh, impacts into magma oceans or just after the uh, recrystallization of a magma ocean don't leave behind a, a record in terms of a basin structure. And the last thing, this is what I skipped in the end, uh, but I want to give you the, the, the summary of it was the thermal evolution of the moon was indeed impacted, uh, affected by impacts. So the, due to the heat that was delivered by impact, it cooled down much slower. And uh, there you also have to consider the ejector blanket that was covering the moon because that worked as some sort of insulation and uh, significantly reduced the cooling history as well. Okay, um, yeah, I'm done. I think with this, I will thank you for your attention and um, maybe there are some questions. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kai. Um, uh, anyone have questions? If you have questions, please you know, unmute yourself and then ask the question to, to Professor Winnerman.
Then let me ask the question first. You, know, you, you talk about that you have two models for initial condition, one is hot moon and one is hot, uh, cold moon. What's the reason for these two, 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 you know, two different um, uh, lunar models, one hot, one cold? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I believe more into a warm or hot moon, um, but that clearly depends on what sort of cooling history you assume. So I think there is not much question about that after the moon was formed, it was rather hot and maybe completely molten. Um, but how quick then this uh, moon uh, or this, this huge deep magma ocean then crystallized, that's um, something we, I mean, I made here an assumption that this probably lasts about 150 and 200, 200 billion years, which is longer than was previously assumed. Previously, people thought that the magma ocean crystallizes much, much earlier. But lately, also, ge geodynamic cooling models are sort of in line with this. And uh, you may recall the talk from Maxime. Um, I think uh, he probably also proposed a very similar history of the cooling, the cooling history of the magma ocean. So, in fact, I would rely more on the hot model that we assume here. I think that is realistic for the early stage. The cold uh, assumptions only apply for the, the later stages, so something about four billion years or so when the moon had sufficient time to cool down. And then that is something that at some point stays more or less the same and doesn't really further cool down. And another thing is, is the uh, late uh, crystallization of the magma ocean uh, associated related to the question on the, on the late heaven bombardment event. I mean that the uh, question whether this, it was there or not. Uh, somehow it was tied to the the uh, the certification of the of the lunar crust. Is it? Yeah, I mean that was uh, kind of um, made this assumption. However, I have to say that um, you know the the existence of a late heavy bombardment uh, is is you know based on two things. I mean, it's on one side the 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 the. Um, that uh, a number of uh, large impact basins were dated in a sort of rather short period. But that's maybe just the sampling bias. That's what at least I believe in. But then this late heavy bombardment flux models, where you have this uh, short increase, have been also used to explain all sorts of other things like remelting of parts of the crust and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, as I've shown in here, there is no need actually to come up with this more complex models. If you just assume a simple exponential decay, I don't see where, where we have any problems to explain all the observations that we have. Uh, so there's, there's no need to explain, uh, you know, the, for instance, the, the, uh, amount, the disproportional delivery of material, as I've shown in here. There, that was one reason why the sawtooth model was invented, which is kind of variant of the late heavy bombardment, if you will. Um, uh, that that is, not, is not necessary. Just assuming the right retention factors and everything, we get away with this very simple um, exponential decay model. So there's this I don't see any reason to come up with these more complicated flux models, including the late heavy bombardment. Okay, great, uh, Kai. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, very, you know, very detailed talk. You know, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Bye bye. Have a good day.